Good morning. Good morning. 11.30. So Jonathan said I had till 1. You had to be out at 1? <laughs> that was a nervous laugh. <laughs> it's a good laugh, but uh, I know you'll be hungry by then. Um, a, a quick introduction. First of all, thank you for your hospitality. You guys have um, been wonderful, especially Gary and Sue. You guys rock. Thank you both. And you have a lovely beautiful green island. There's only one way it gets so green, huh? <laughs> lots, of, lots of rain. So we're in a drought in Southern California, and um, we welcome the rain. It actually rained one day when, when we've been here um, back in Southern California, so everybody's cheering. Um, let me give you a quick introduction of, of me and my family. Tracy, we've been married 31 years. Uh, we've got four boys, I, th um, one daughter-in-law and two little, little granddaughters right there. Um, they're all grown up. Um, let's see, we, um, we've lived in San Clemente, Southern California, which is about 45 minutes from Disneyland. That's the landmark. It's a little beach community. Um, we've lived there about 21 years. We moved there and helped start a church. And about seven years ago, um, the lead elder, the, the founding pastor, uh, left, and the elders asked if I would lead the congregation. So the last seven years, we've been leading. And then about two and a half years ago, uh, we joined 412. I think we were, were we the first church, Andrew? One of the first churches. So we were wrestling for that position, um, <laughs> one, being one of the first churches. Which, by the way, that makes us sister churches, does it not? Yeah. So come visit your family in, in Southern California. You've always got a place to stay there. And I, and I mean that seriously. Um, if you come visit, we would love to, to host you and have you in our church and our church family as well. So this morning, I want to talk about being offended by God, being offended by God. And, and it deserves an explanation. I'll give that to you in just a minute. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was talking with a, a man in our, our church who only knew me from sermons. You know, sitting out there, we didn't really have much of a personal relationship. And, and he was telling me how difficult his life was. And at the end of his story, he said something that caught my attention. He said, my life isn't like yours. I've had lots of troubles. I wanted to punch him. <laughs> Hope you're not recording that. <laughs> But, uh, I, you know, I think that's a mistake that we can often make, and we think, you know, um, I've had a lot of troubles, and you haven't. You, you know, we compare ourselves to others. You know, when you, when you look from the outside at people, um, a lot of people look like their lives are perfect. Do they not? They, they, they look like, hey, you've got your act totally together. But there's one thing I know, and I know it f for two reasons. I know that everybody has troubles. Two, one, one is from personal experience, just talking to people and being a pastor for many years. You learn that absolutely every single person has troubles, but also Jesus said it. Here's what he said in John 16, verse 33. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. You'll have troubles, absolutely guaranteed. Some people more than others. But absolutely every single person has trouble in this, in this life. And so the question in this life is not whether you're going to have troubles, but when it comes, how will it impact you? What's going to be the impact in your life? How is it going to affect your relationship with God? Now, I want to show you, this is a, next slide, is a picture of my son Spencer and his girlfriend Kelly. Looks pretty good on the outside, doesn't he? I'm proud of him. Good looking kid, good looking girlfriend. He's smart. He's uh, uh, a second-year law student up in um, the University of Montana. He's a really smart kid. Looks pretty good on the outside, but here's what you can't see on the inside. Um, about seven years ago, he returned from uh, a mission trip in Cambodia. He lived there for seven months. Um, and um, he returned home and had a grand mal seizure. Um, right out of the blue, shocking, went to the hospital, and about two, three days later had brain surgery to remove a cancerous tumor in his brain. And since that time, he's had severe epilepsy. Underline the word severe. Um, it, it literally impacts every moment of his day, every day of his life. And I prayed, he prayed, we prayed, the church prayed, and... Um, 
it was, it was one of those things that was just shocking. We, we prayed, you know, Lord, would you, would you deliver him from that tumor? Would you dissolve that tumor so that when the doctors go in, um, you know, it wouldn't even be there. They wouldn't have to do surgery. And every time he has a seizure, we pray, Lord, that, that that would be the very last seizure he ever has. And yet, it would appear that so far God says, no. And, and that's a really uncomfortable thing. Jesus said it, in this world you will have troubles. And how many of you, from your own personal experience, know that that's true? Okay, the rest of you are liars. <laughs> Well, put it this way. If you're not in trouble now, trouble's coming. It's coming. It's guaranteed. So how does trouble impact your relationship with God? You know, we cried out to God. I I believe when when Spencer went in for surgery, there were probably thousands of people around the world in different networks, people saying, pray for this guy's son. Thousands of people praying for for Spencer to, to be healed and not have to have that surgery. And yet, you know, here we are today. In, in fact, this last quarter, he had two seizures that nearly killed him, both, both of them. And um, what do you do with that? When you cry out to God and you sense that there's, there's not an answer, he didn't, he didn't answer the way we asked him. Do you think, okay, maybe God doesn't like me. Maybe God doesn't like Spencer. Maybe he's not listening. Maybe there's sin in my life. Maybe God isn't powerful. Maybe there is no God. And so we wrestle with questions. I think, you know, difficult circumstances beg questions about God. And here's what we can do. We can make the mistake of using our limited perspective, our limited understanding, and coming to conclusions about God, His power, His love, His presence erroneous conclusions about God that shrink him down to human size. They make him weak, they make him small, they make him uncaring, they make him distant. And that's just not right. It's it's truly a mistake to do that. So I want to share a story with you out of the Bible. It comes from Matthew chapter 11. And uh, if you have a Bible, do you guys guys read your Bibles? Do you bring them to church? Electronic Bibles. That's novel. Anybody have a real Bible? (laughs) Good, Pam brought one. Okay, um, Matthew chapter 11. So Jesus is, uh, he's going around teaching, his disciples are out. Um, He sent them out already in Matthew chapter 10. And so he's teaching and two guys come up to Jesus and they say to to him, um, basically, hey, John the Baptist is in prison now and he's sent to us to you and he wants us uh, to ask you a question. And the question is this, are you the one who was to come? And, and I think uh, that one should probably be capitalized. Are you the one that was to come, or should we expect someone else? Because get yourself in John's head. He's, he's asking, are you the Messiah? Because I'm confused right now. I'm, I'm wondering, I'm kind of doubting, and I really need to understand if you are the Messiah. That's the question these guys were sent to ask. And and if you know the context, that's an absolutely remarkable question. Because back up eight chapters, just not that long ago, and picture this scene. And you've really got to picture it in order to get the impact of it. John the Baptist is doing what he does best at the Jordan River. He's baptizing a man named Jesus. Comes up out of the water. And what happens? The Holy Spirit descends from heaven like a dove upon this guy Jesus. And then, I don't know if the earth shook, but it should have. This voice from heaven says, This is my son, whom I love. In him I am well pleased. And it should probably be, This is my son. Or, you know, just... <laughs> Like this giant voice that you would never forget for the rest of your whole life. This is my son. Now fast forward. Hey, can you send a couple of guys to ask Jesus if he's the one that we're expecting? Do you get that? Do you see the 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 con like John, what happened? So what did happen? One word. Trouble. Remember what Jesus said? 
In this world, you'll have trouble. That's the, that's the problem that John's having. You see, put yourself in John's shoes. He's in a dungeon, and Jesus is out there. And he's thinking, look, you're the Messiah, I'm the forerunner. You're Batman, I'm Robin. Does that translate here in the Isle of Man? Okay, good. The plot line is this. I'm in trouble, you come rescue me. You're the son of God. You're supposed to get me out of this trouble. He's got this expectation, and he's rotting in a dungeon, and he's thinking, well, maybe, maybe that whole heaven thing and the voice and the... I'm confused. And Jesus knew exactly what John was thinking. He, he just, okay, so here's what he says. Matthew chapter 11, starting at verse 4. He says this, Jesus answered and said to them, go and tell John the things which you hear and see. Now, I love that. The things, he, didn't, he didn't say, go tell John, yes. Go give him my title. He didn't say, he could have said a lot of things. Go give him religious philosophy, read some Old Testament passages to him. He didn't say that. He said, go tell him absolutely what you see and what you hear, what you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, the absolute facts. And, and here's, here's what you're going to see. The blind see and the lame walk. Okay, pause right there. That's pretty good stuff. Would you agree? Yeah. Blind see and lame walk? You can stop right there. You don't have to go any further. Well, I'll go back and I'll tell him that Anywhere this guy goes, the blind see. That's a big deal. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, raised up. That's a big deal too. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. I love that that is also considered miraculous. Okay? And then I picture this, this last verse, verse 6. It's like you've got to picture Jesus. It says, go to John and grab hold of his beard and look at him in the face and tell him from me, to him. Tell him this. Tell him, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Blessed. Blessed is that person that doesn't get offended because of me. And, and I want to explain that. Let me, let me talk a little bit about that Greek word, offended, for a minute. The, the, the word in Greek is scandalizo, and it means to put a stumbling block or an impediment in the way upon which another may trip or fall or to offend. In other words, a, a scandalizo is something that, like, if I were going to Jonathan, this is a scandalizo, boom, it would cause me to fall. It'd be ugly. Seriously, that's a long drop. Okay? But it's something put in your way to make you fall. It's an offense. Okay? Now, it's related to the English word scandalon. Anybody know what a scandalon is? No? This is new? Okay. See that, that little platform that the bait is on? That's a scandal on. It's, it's a bait stick or a bait platform in an animal trap. And as soon as you grab a hold of the bait on that platform, you're stuck. Isn't that fascinating? Okay. And, and get this. Trouble, I believe this, trouble is the bait of Satan to cause you to get offended at God. And when you do, it can destroy your faith. Absolutely destroy your faith. You know, Jonathan, a couple of times you were referring to um, the parable of the sower this morning, good seed. So um, Jesus told this parable. By the way, I believe it's the key, it's the key parable in Scripture. Um, a sower, a farmer goes out to sow his seed. He sows seed on four different kinds of soil. So he's saying there's four different kinds of people, four different kinds of hearts. And he says one, one kind of soil is, um, is the shallow soil. In Mark chapter 4, verse 16, he says, they hear the word and at once they receive it with joy. So we're talking about Christians. That person that receives the word of God into their heart, they receive it with joy. They go to church and they're celebrating. They're raising their hands with all the rest of us, right? Okay. And, and he says, but since they have no root, there's a shallow root. They last only a short time. Get this. It's the same word, trouble. When trouble or persecution comes, did Jesus say it would come? It'll come. 
But when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Now, those two words there in English, fall away, is one word in Greek. Guess what that word is? Scandalizo. They quickly get offended. Listen, there's the potential for each and every one of us to fall away, to get offended, to stumble when trouble comes. Now, one of the key points about that parable that Jesus was trying to make is you get to choose the condition of your soil. It's not like you're born with, you know, shallow soil or deep soil or, you know, hard soil. No, you choose the condition of your soil. And here's my challenge to you this morning. Choose a deep, abiding faith in God. Don't choose the shallow soil. Don't be that person. Time to grow up. Yeah. It's time to get a solid faith in Almighty God so that when trouble comes, you do not fall away. You do not take offense yeah. at God. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's a big, big part of it. Now, Jesus made us a promise. And it's really interesting to note that it is a promise. Blessed is the one who does not get offended because of me. You're blessed. Do you want the blessing of God in your life? Then don't get offended at God in his ways. Don't get offended by trouble, by circumstances. Don't get offended by unanswered prayers. Don't get offended by failures. God says, trust me. Trust me in these things. And we cry out to God, God, you know, why? Why is my son Spencer still having epileptic seizures? And we can come up with all sorts of conclusions, but you want to know the conclusion that I've come up with? I don't know. I love that Jesus said to his disciples, John 13, verse 7, he said, you don't understand what I'm doing now, but sometime later you will. It's like, okay, I'll trust you in that. But you're right, I do not understand <laughs> what you are doing now. In fact, I don't even like it. But I don't understand. Now, here's what you need to know when trouble comes. God loves you, and he's in control. Do you get that? God loves you, and he's in control. He's in control of all the circumstances. It's not like he's sleeping, taking a nap, and then, you know, something happened in your life. He woke up, and his eyes wringing his hands. What do I do now? It's suddenly out of control. It's not like that. God's got a purpose, and he's got a plan, and he's working it, even when we don't understand it. So God had a purpose and a plan with John the Baptist. What it was, I don't know. He got his head chopped off. I, I don't know why that happened. Do you believe that God had a purpose when Jesus died on the cross? Yes. I believe he did. The Bible tells us all about that purpose and plan. You know, God has a purpose in my son Spencer's life, and he is working it very carefully. And God has a purpose and a plan in your life, and he's working that plan as well. And our job on our end of this is to trust him in it. And so the question is this, when trouble comes, because it's coming, how will you respond? Will you trust him? Will you know that he's in control and that he loves you? Even when you don't understand. And Jesus says, blessed is the man who is not offended because of me. Okay, I want to I read a couple of stories today. One of them is out of Deuteronomy chapter 8. I, I love this story. Deuteronomy chapter 8 is um, Moses giving a farewell speech. It's one of several farewell speeches to the Israelites. And um, it, it's, kind of a, it's kind of funny if you climb into the story and you really read within the context. So Moses says to him uh, in, in one of these farewell speeches, he says, do you remember when we were in the desert for 40 years? You're supposed to laugh at that. I mean, seriously, what are they supposed to say? Like, he's talking to all the guys that he spent 40 years in the desert. De well, yeah, Moses, we remember that part. Remember when we were hungry? Yeah, that, that, I was really hungry. Remember when we were thirsty? This, Moses, he, he said this, seriously. We remember the thirsty part. It was desert and there was no water. Like, seriously, what happens when there's no water in the desert? 
You, 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 you start by getting thirsty and then you end by dying. So, <laughs> so but, but Moses was asking that question. It's kind of, kind of silly when you think about that. So and here's what Moses said. He said, God was humbling you and testing you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. Now, picture yourself an Israelite and you're listening to Moses talk about that. Would you not have cause for offense? Would you not pause for a minute and think, think, wait a minute. God was in charge of that whole thing of me nearly dying of thirst. God did that on purpose? And Moses would say, yeah, he did. He arranged the whole thing. Would you not have cause for offense? I, you know, I think you would. And God arranged the whole thing with a purpose. Okay. Know this for yourself. Sometimes God is going to lead you into difficult circumstances. And he's going to do it on purpose with a plan. And that tragic thing in your life, that struggle that, that you're facing, that's from God. Specifically designed for you. I don't know why. But, but consider that possibility. Okay, Moses goes on. Deuteronomy chapter 8, starting at verse 16. Here's what he says. He gave you manna to eat in the desert to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. Now, do you get that? Just look at that. Note this. God had something in mind called the end. In the end, he was looking ahead to something that they probably weren't thinking about. And the end, according to Moses here, that God was thinking about was good. In the end, it might go well with you. God was working a plan so that it would go well with them. With them. They just couldn't see it yet, by the way. When they're hungry and they're thirsty, all they're thinking about is, ah, I need some. I need some water. Okay, now, at this point, he begins to talk about the future, okay, when they get into the promised land. Verse 17, you may say to yourself, when you get there, when your belly's full, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember, verse 18, the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. So God tests you in the desert to prove your faith. Do you understand that principle? He tests you in the desert to prove your faith because According to this, he's got something better for you. That better thing is called the promised land for these Israelites. That's what he's talking about. He's got something better. But he wants you to get into the promised land, but he's got to test you in the desert first. Why? Because he needs to know that you'll be faithful to him when he blesses you with more. He wants to know that when the good times come, that you will know that your prosperity, your blessing, your food, your full belly comes from Him. It comes from Him. So He tests you in the desert. He can't test you in the good times. He tests you in the desert so that you look to Him for provision and you know that whatever you have comes from Him. Because listen, if you, if you can't prove it in the desert, you're not going to prove it in prosperity. Prosperity, when it comes, is just going to draw you away from God. It's going to make you too busy for God, too busy to pray, too busy to serve in the church, too, too, too full of your own stuff, your own goodness, your own belly. Do you see the challenge that prosperity brings? It does. It pulls you away from God. Unless you've been founded and secure in the goodness and the faith in, in God. He tests you. He tests you to prove your faith. Okay, blessed is he who does not get offended when God tests you. Because in the end, he wants to make sure that it goes well with you. Problem is, in the middle of the testing, in the middle of the suffering, in the middle of the hunger and the thirst and the scorching heat or whatever the circumstances you're, face, you're facing, you're not thinking about the end. You're thinking about what's right in front of you. You're thinking about 
God, I prayed a thousand prayers and you appear silent at this moment. And that's the struggle. That's the challenge. The challenge is trust him right in the middle of it. You feel alone. You feel like you may be doubting. You feel like John the Baptist in the dungeon. God says this, blessed is the one who doesn't get offended because of me. Doesn't get offended because of my ways. Okay, one more story from John chapter 6. Then we'll close. I, I love this story. John chapter 6, is, uh, Jesus had a great day. He fed 5,000 people. Whew, good catering job. 5,000 people, and then he sent the disciples off in the boat, you know, away they went, and then he went to go pray, and then he went and caught up with them on foot. That's a good day. Over the water, by the way. So, um, <laughs> so on foot, over the water, uh, the crowds go looking for him. And they find him in that little town called Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee. And when they finally catch up with him, Jesus greets them and he says to them, you know, I know the only reason why you've come looking for me. You want food. Now that's kind of interesting, is it not? You know, there's lots of entertainment, miracles, good things going on, but they got a free meal on the other side of the lake and they want more free meals because he's given them out, okay? So this begins a conversation, by the way, between Jesus and this group of people that in John chapter 6 lasts 45 verses. Whew, that's longer than many chapters in the Bible. I'm going to spare you. I'm going to shrink this down. I'm going to give you the Roger Gales translation, make it really short, but it's a fascinating conversation. Here's, here's how it goes. Um, so he says, I, I, I know that you're following me because you want free food. So food is the topic here, okay? And he says, my words, now stop striving after food that spoils and start, start working for food that lasts for eternity. So Jesus changes from talking about food that you eat, you know, like you're going to have very soon. And he's talking about spiritual things. But that's a transition that the crowd didn't get, you know, whoop, right over their heads. And he says, uh, the crowd now says, okay, so how do we do the work for God? Stop, you know, stop striving for spiritual food or for food that you can eat and strive for spiritual food. Okay, how do we do the work of God? And Jesus says, believe. Believe in the one who he sent. Okay, do a miracle and we'll believe in you. And Jesus said, here's a miracle. God's offering you bread from heaven that gives life to everyone. Okay, still, you know, kind of mysterious talk now. And they say, okay, we'll take some of that bread now, please. Give us some bread. They're missing it. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I love these words. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty and then he says, but you don't believe that I'm the bread that came down from heaven. Okay, this conversation takes a shift right here at this place. You don't believe in me. You don't believe that I'm the bread that came down from heaven. And then they think to themselves, you came down from heaven? Seriously, you're Joseph's kid. I know your brothers and sisters. Mm, you see it? So there's a little conversation shift that takes place in, in their hearts, a little attitude. Um, and then they begin to grumble. Isn't this Jesus, son of Joseph? Jesus says, stop grumbling. I am the bread that came down from heaven. This bread is my flesh, which I give so that others can have life. Now, what's Jesus doing? Do you think he's unaware of what's going on? Not at all. He knows exactly what he's doing. I, I love what he's doing. In fact, it'd be very entertaining if you were right there. Okay, that made them really mad. It, it says, um, it says um, a sharp dispute broke out. Do you think Jesus could have missed a sharp dispute <laughs> among the crowd? Okay, and they said, can he really give us his flesh to eat? Okay. Um, now, I think a normal person, Jesus was not a normal person, would see that this conversation is elevating, it's escalating, people are getting angrier, and they're, you know, it's like, it's... And, and Jesus could take it one of two ways, right? Up or down? He said, sorry, guys. I mean to get you guys upset. It's all good. 
sit down, I'm going to make you some bread. <laughs> right? Now, but he doesn't. Listen, here's what Jesus says. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Okay, now we got some people throwing up over here on the side. <laughs> Seriously. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. But if you feed on me, you will live. You see what Jesus is doing? It says even his disciples at that point got upset. This is a hard teaching. Who could accept it? And then he says in John 6, 61, you can put this up. Jesus asked them, does this offend you? I, I just want to know, does this offend you? Seriously, Jesus? Of course. It's like they're all offended at that point. They're all offended. Now, I think Jesus is very intentional about the language that he chose. And it's not like he's saying, oops, I didn't know that was gross talk. I didn't know that that would get you guys upset. Forgive me, let's have lunch, you know, sit down and we're going we're to make it all good. Okay, then he goes on, John 6, verse 66. 666. <laughs> Do you guys recognize that number? Yeah. Revelation chapter 13, the number of man, number of the beast. Anyway, I'm just saying it's kind of interesting. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. That's fascinating. Why did they not walk with him anymore? They were offended, weren't they? They were offended by Jesus. And Jesus did it on purpose, didn't he? That was no accident. Jesus was offending their minds to reveal their hearts. Because Jesus knew something about that crowd. Remember, go back to the beginning of the conversation. How did he start it? Some of you are following me because you want a free meal. You want the freebie. You want the stuff. You're here for the good times. You are not here to worship the Son of God. Do you follow what Jesus is doing? And so he offends them intentionally to send those guys packing that don't believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and aren't willing to pay the price. Verse 67, then Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go, go too? You guys had enough? Now's your chance. Seriously, guys, we've had a good run. You can go home. I love this, verse 68, one of my favorite passages in the Bible. But Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You and you alone have the words of eternal life. I love that. When my son Spencer has a seizure, I hate it. I don't like it one bit. I get a phone call from a hospital or somebody and I hate it and it breaks my heart in, in fact one of the things I was thinking um, this is a tangent but I believe that somebody in here has a son that you're that you're thinking about even as I speak these words and it's for you I hate it but I've got a choice Jesus said in this world you have trouble and when trouble comes, you have the opportunity to get offended at God because you've got expectations. You can get angry at God. You can doubt his love. You can doubt his presence, his bigness. You can shrink him down into a little pocket-sized God and think that he's not answering your prayers because he doesn't love you or he doesn't have the power or he's mean or whatever. You can shrink him down because you're offended. Or you can respond like Peter. To whom should we go? Who else has the words of eternal life? And Jesus says this, blessed is he who does not get offended because of me. And who else will you, will, will you turn to? Who will you turn to? Don't forfeit the opportunity to turn to the only one who can give you life. It's the only one, it's Jesus. 
It's him. He has the words of eternal life. He's still big. He's still God. He's still on the throne. He still loves you. Don't get offended by him. Don't get offended by what he does or what he doesn't do for you. He is still God. He's still trustworthy. He's still listening to your prayers. He still loves you, even when it looks like trouble. What's the answer in times of trouble? I love it. Go back just a few verses. John 6, verse 35. When Jesus said these words, he said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me. Pause right there. That is what you need to know in times of trouble. Come to me. Come to me. Come to Jesus, the person. Not the religious philosophy, not your Bible, not some, you know, not your friends, not to church. Come to me. Come to Jesus, the person, the Son of God. Eat of Him. Believe in Him. He is the one who gives you life. He is the source. That's what He said. I'm the bread of life. Come to me. You'll never go hungry. He's talking about a spiritual hunger. He'll satisfy that spiritual hunger. Notice that He doesn't promise. I will deliver you from all troubles from henceforth. You shall have no troubles. Be blessed. That's the prosperity. You got to turn the dial and go to another church to get that gospel. Because that's not the true gospel. The true gospel is this. In the world, you're going to have trouble. Blessed is he who does not get offended because of me. And Jesus says, come to me. I am the bread of life. Eat of me. Put your faith in me. Come to me. Let's close. I, I want to close with a few invitations today. Three invitations, to be specific. And I don't know how you do this, Jonathan. Do you invite people up here? Whatever you want to do. Yeah, I got it. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. That's good. Three invitations. The first is this. Some of you are in the midst of trouble. I know it. I know that there's trouble in your life. There's pain. There's hurt. There's suffering. There's circumstances in your life that are, that are unpleasant, and you're crying out to God, and you need God to show up. That's basically it. You need God to show up in your circumstances, and you need someone to pray for you this morning for breakthrough. That's, that's the first invitation. Second invitation is, as I was speaking, I, I believe that some of you have just realized for the first time that you've been offended by God, that, that somehow through, through trouble, trials, circumstances, difficult, difficulties in life, you've come to a place where you picked up an offense against God. Maybe you didn't even know it was there. And, and today, very specifically, God is calling you, you, Will you lay that down? Lay down that offense and put your trust in God. And, and here's what I want to say. Don't leave this place without laying that offense down. Blessed is he who's not offended because of me. And here's my third invitation. That, that invitation is this. It's the same one that Regina gave earlier in the service. If you've come here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if, if you've never, if you've never what, what Jesus said, come to me, the bread of life. And you want to do that today. You, you want to make that transaction that says, I want to follow Jesus. And today is your day and now is your time. You can come forward and you can put your faith in him. Give your life to him.